Hi everyone, today we're going to be taking a look at inductors and how they can help us generate a constant current from a constant voltage with minimal losses. It's going to be the first episode in a new mini-series I'm making, this time on direct current control, which we're going to use in a few cool circuits later on. Let's get started. So to start off, let's consider, why do we need current control? It seems like everything, you just give it a voltage and it draws as much current as it needs. Every socket in your house just provides an AC voltage, USB ports will just provide a fixed 5 volt output, so why can't we just stick with that? Well, there's a few things where if you just give them a constant voltage, they'll probably draw a lot more current than what you want. And because they don't just have a fixed resistance, it's quite difficult to control the power going into them just using voltage. So a few examples I've thought of just off the top of my head are LEDs, but not like this, like that. This is a 3 watt LED that would normally be in something like a, a torch maybe or a, even a light bulb in a house. And these will normally be accompanied by a constant current driving circuit. And the reason for that is, as I've mentioned in a previous video, LEDs don't really like to be driven with a fixed voltage. Whereas a fixed current, that's normally how they're rated. The light intensity is roughly proportional to the current that goes through them. And normally on the data sheet, the forward voltage will have quite a bit of range. Whereas the current, the forward current, they'll just say this will do a max of one amp forward current, for example. And the reason why I said this LED wouldn't need one is just because it's so low power, you'd normally just use a resistor, which is inefficient but simple. Whereas when you get to an LED like this, using a resistor, you're just going to be pissing away way too much power. So that's when we need to start thinking about how to make a smart circuit to limit the current. One other example I thought of that I'll quickly mention is charging of batteries. So like this lithium ion cell, this will have a max charge voltage of 4.2 volts, but if you just connect 4.2 volts across it, it's not going to end very well. You want to limit the current going into that cell to stop it charging too quick. And again, you could do it with a resistor, but a constant current driver circuit, some kind of switching circuit, will be a lot more efficient. So now that we not only know what we want to do, but why we want to do it, let's think about how we're going to do it. And for that we're going to make use of inductors. Now this is because inductors are very good at stabilizing a current. They will do what they can to keep the current flowing through them the same. Meaning that if you suddenly put a big voltage across it, it will represent a high impedance and that current won't be able to suddenly shoot up. And if you remove the voltage while there's a current flowing, an inductor will actually become a source and try and push current round, which can often lead to issues. But to better think about how this is actually going to work, I'm afraid I'm going to have to briefly bring in some equations. So hopefully you guys can read this, I did it in my best handwriting. This is one of the most common equations used when dealing with inductors, and it tells us that the voltage across an inductor is equal to the inductance times the rate of change of the current going through it. Which isn't really that useful because we don't want a voltage, we want a current. So let's rearrange this to just get current on one side. Here this is now telling us that whatever voltage we put across the inductor, divide that by the inductance, and the current is going to go up at that rate. So for example, one volt across a one milli Henry inductor, every second the current would go up by 1000 amps. Which sounds like a lot, but normally you wouldn't have it switched on for one second. It might be, if it was on for one millisecond, the current would go up by one amp. But we still don't have a current here, we've got a weird rate of current, and we just want current. So now we can sort of integrate both sides, assuming a constant voltage. That then tells us that the current through our inductor is the voltage we've put across it multiplied by how long it's been across it divided by the inductance. So for an example, if I bring back the inductor from earlier, this measures at around 800 microhenry. So if I had a 12 volt input to my circuit, which I can either switch across this or not switch across this, let's say we turn it on for 0.1 milliseconds. That would be 12 volts times 0.1 milliseconds divided by 800 microhenry and that would give us a current of 1.5 amps. But that then raises the next problem, which is that, as we can see on the equation above, if we keep the voltage the same, the current's just going to keep on rising. So what we end up doing is switching this voltage on and off to try and maintain the current fairly close to the level that we want. And to do that, we make use of hysteresis. So if you imagine this sheet of paper is the screen of an oscilloscope, and let's say this line is the target current that we want, so 1 amp. But as we just saw, by putting the voltage across the inductor, we can either increase the current or decrease the current. We can't keep it the same. And for that, I'm going to add two more lines. So let's put a line up here. 
and a line down here. We're going to have 1.1 amps and 0 0.9 amps. Now if you imagine we've just turned our circuit on, we've got no current, so we're going to start all the way down here. We're below the 1 amp that we want, so we're going to turn our voltage across the inductor on, and the current's going to rise up. When we hit 1 amp, what do we do? Well, we don't turn it off, because then we'll go below 1 amp. So what we do is we're going to leave it turned on until we hit 1.1 amps. Then, we're going to turn it off, and let it go all the way down to 0.9 amps then back on, and off, and so on. Then our average current is going to end up at or very close to 1 amp, but our switching losses in the transistor we're using to switch the voltage across the inductor aren't going to be stupidly high, and we can determine those by the switching frequency, which is determined by how wide this hysteresis range is. So if I made this go from 0.5 amps to 1.5 amps, it would switch a lot slower, because at 0.5 amps, when it turned it on, it would take quite a while for the current to increase by a whole amp. Whereas here, it only has to increase by 200 milliamps, so it would go a lot faster. But you'd have a much smoother, lower ripple output. And this is what's known as direct current control. Instead of having a fixed PWM frequency, with a duty cycle that is then varied by some control circuitry, this is as simple as basically just having a comparator with some hysteresis on it, and switch it on when you reach 0.9, and then switch it off when you reach 1.1. Hopefully that all makes sense. Make sure you say in the comments if it doesn't, and I'm sure the community will be happy to help. So I think the next thing we should do is see, is this actually true, or have I just been speaking out my ass? So far all I've done is given equations and expected you to believe me. So let's try putting a voltage across this inductor, and seeing if we can watch the current rise. Now unfortunately it's not quite as simple as just connecting my power supply and measuring the current because the output of the power supply can't turn on very fast. So we'd basically just be watching the output voltage of the power supply slowly rising. That's because it's got output capacitance and it's not designed to turn on super fast. And that means I'm going to have to do some quick soldering, adding on a little MOSFET here onto one of the pins. And then we're going to use this MOSFET to turn the voltage across the inductor on and off. That also means we can try out some PWM slightly later on. Right, so here's most of what we need. I've got my MOSFET here with the drain being fed by the output of the inductor then the source is going to ground the other terminal of the inductor is positive and the purple wire is the gate I am however also going to add a little gate drive circuit because we want this to turn on and off fast so that we can visualize the current rising right all finished so positive into the inductor through the MOSFET out back to ground purple wire is the gate drive that goes to this little circuit, which is just a gate drive IC, a fat decoupling cap on top, and a button. And when I press that button, the power supply goes into current limiting, which is a good sign. Next, we've just got the problem of measuring that current. And for that, I'm going to start off by trying to make use of this isolated current probe. Although I don't know if it's going to have high enough resolution, because it's got two ranges, a 1 millivolt per amp range and a 10 millivolt per amp range. And we're looking at a peak of 2 amps which should be 20 millivolts, so let's give it a go. These rely on the same Hall effect principle that I went over in the last video, except these have got bandwidths in the megahertz, so these are normally pretty expensive. Right, well it seems to be working. Here you can see on the oscilloscope screen, we've got the current, I've set it up to 500 milliamps per division, so right now we're at zero, and if I press the button on the gate drive circuit, boom, flies up to two amps. So then if I do single shot capture, press the button again, look at that, it's the current going up, just like the maths told us. So that's quite exciting, isn't it? It shows that the equation wasn't made up. But next we're going to look at a bit of a problem with this circuit, and that happens when you turn the MOSFET off. So what I've done now to visualise this problem is I've put my normal scope probe just across the inductor so we can measure the voltage across it. Which, with what we've looked at so far, it should be 1 volt across the inductor when we turn our switch on, and then when we turn the MOSFET back off, it should be 0 volts, surely. Oh, if only it were that simple. So you're probably wondering why I've got the scope in 20 volts per division. Well, let's do a single shot capture when we turn the MOSFET off, and we'll very quickly find out. Single shot, MOSFET on, MOSFET off. Hmm, wait a minute. That was 20 volts per division. So when we turn it on, 
goes up, you can barely see it on here, because we've got one volt across our inductor, but then when we turn it off, 20, 40, 60, 80, this is 85 volts that the inductor is now creating, and you can tell because it's negative voltage instead of positive, so it's coming from the inductor. And this is because, as I mentioned at the start, all an inductor wants in life is for the current through it to stay the same. So when you turn the voltage off and you're not pumping current through it anymore, it gets a bit sad and tries to retaliate by making its own current. But there's an open circuit, so where's its current going to go? Well, it's going to push as hard as it can to get some current to flow. And, of course, how hard you push is your voltage. Luckily this inductor doesn't have a huge amount of stamina, so it's only pushing for about 35 microseconds. But this voltage is still enough to damage stuff. And also, it kind of hinders what we're trying to do, because what we want is, when we put our voltage across the inductor, the current slowly rises, and then when we remove our voltage, the current should slowly fall back down. But because of this huge spike in voltage, that represents the current in the inductor going and shooting down. So the way to fix this is by adding into our circuit what is known as a flyback diode. And basically, we're taking advantage of the fact that when the inductor generates a voltage, it's negative relative to the voltage that we're putting in. So here, the voltage goes from right to left that we put in, positive here, negative there. So if I put the diode the other way around, then when we put our voltage in, the diode's just going to block it and it'll flow through the inductor. Then when the inductor generates its own voltage, it's going to go through this diode and just back into the inductor, which should not only clamp the voltage that the inductor generates to about half a volt, but it also means all that lovely current that we're putting into the inductor just circulates around, and the only loss is the voltage drop across the diode. So the current should then decrease at a rate that you could calculate using minus 0.5 volts in the equations from earlier. So let's add this in and see what happens. There we go, now we have a flyback diode in our circuit. So again, positive on the right goes through the inductor, and then the diode is basically just directly across the inductor, but in reverse relative to the voltage we're applying. Here we are back at the scope. I'm now at just one volt per division because hopefully this is going to work. You can see when I turn it on, it goes up a little bit, and then when I turn it off, it goes back down. We're going to have to single shot to see if this has made any difference. So on, so now there's one volt kind of across the inductor. Turn it off, and there we go. So you can see instead of it lasting, what was it, I think about 20 microseconds last time, 2030, it's now lasting. 500, 1, 2, almost 3 milliseconds. But our negative dip's only going down to about minus 1 volt, which is perfect. Ignore this little transient, that's just the diode I'm using is pretty slow, so I'm pretty sure that's just the time it takes to turn on, basically. Right, well this is quite cool. So what I've done is I've swapped the bottom on the gate drive circuit for the output of a function generator, which is toggling the MOSFET at 1 hertz, and you can see the current rising and the current falling because I've put the current probe across the inductor. So the idea with this whole system is that we can then do this very fast and the rising and falling edges will blend together and give us a nice smooth current. So let's have a go at that. Let's go for 10 hertz. So remember this is the inductor current. So right now our circuit isn't really doing any better than just directly PWMing the thing we want to current limit, which is usually not a great idea. Now bigger inductance would drag out those rising and falling edges more, which would blend this together, but what we can do instead is just increase the frequency. So let's try 100 hertz now. There we go, starting to look a bit like what we want. You can see the current rising here and then falling back down there, but crucially it doesn't actually reach the limit anymore, and I can probably change that by adjusting the frequency. Apologies for the not very good triggering. Let's see if I can get that any better. There we go, and now I can adjust the frequency, and you can see here, current rises, hits the limit, and that's just because of resistance of the circuit and things. I know the maths told us the current would just keep on rising forever, but obviously that's not actually going to happen. This inductor has a lot of turns, so it's actually got quite decent resistance. So the current rises, then it levels out, and then when we turn the MOSFET back off, the current drops down. And if I increase the frequency, it starts to all blend together and you can see we're not we're not reaching the full limit anymore. The other thing I can do is change the duty cycle. So instead of changing how fast we're switching the MOSFET, I can change how long it's turned on for. 
and that's where the real power of this circuit comes in. So if I zoom out slightly, I'll be able to see the average a bit better. Now watch what happens when I change the duty cycle. Right now it's around 50%. If I decrease it, you can see our average drops down. And we're entering what's known as discontinuity. So that's where the current goes up, it comes down, and then it spends some time sat at zero. And we want to try and avoid that, because that means our output doesn't have a nice smooth current at all times. And you can avoid that by switching faster or just running everything at higher power. So if I bring the duty cycle up, there we go, look at that. The inductor current never reaches the max, never reaches the minimum. It just bounces between two thresholds, just like what I showed at the start. Now let's try further increasing the frequency. Now we're at one kilohertz, and again, let's change the duty cycle. Wow, look how nice that is now. So this is literally just a current and I can shift it up and down, control the current. And again, the higher the frequency, the less and less the ripple is. Let me turn down my intensity graded display because that's making it look really noisy at the moment. There you go. Low duty cycle, high duty cycle. And this is zoomed in a bit more. You can see the current just basically never, never goes to zero. It's lovely. So, Right now, this is at 500 milliamps per division, so we're hovering between about half an amp and just a bit over an amp. So we're probably averaging about 800 milliamps here. And now with PWM, you get nice smooth control, so adjusting the duty cycle varies the current, and the frequency varies how much ripple you get. In the next videos, we're going to be taking a look at a system that's a bit easier to implement, which is direct current control, as opposed to pulse width modulation, which Technically, we're not directly controlling the current. Right now, we don't even have any feedback. Now, the main limit on how good this circuit can be is how fast you can switch, because that reduces the ripple. So if I now switch to 10 kilohertz, let's see whether I can actually do that with this MOSFET. I would be slightly surprised. What I'm going to do is I'm going to cheat slightly and turn on averaging. And you can see that gives a nice, smooth waveform still. There we go, down at sort of about zero amps, then we've got half an amp, one amp, one and a half amps, and that's just by adjusting the duty cycle. Now one thing that is definitely worth bearing in mind is that at the moment our circuit looks a bit like this, with our positive input here, negative here, and here is the output from our gate drive. And the thing with this is that when we turn our MOSFET on, we get current flowing from the positive through the inductor and out to the negative. When we turn it off, the current keeps flowing through the inductor, because that's what the inductor wants, and it goes through the diode. So you've got through the diode, MOSFET on, goes through here, MOSFET off, goes through the diode. But the current's not going anywhere in this circuit. Right now, it doesn't do anything. It gives us a constant current through an inductor, but who cares, that doesn't do anything. So in the next video, we're going to be taking a look at how we can make this circuit actually useful by adding in a component in here. For example, an LED. And this is when the circuit starts to become properly useful. Hopefully you found that all interesting. It was mostly setting up for the next two videos which are going to be showing interesting uses of direct current control and how to implement it in the real world. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and as always, have a good one.